Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jennifer. Thank you for having me here, uh, TEDx, UIU, Syed, and for all of you guys for sticking around on a rainy afternoon in Dhaka. So, um, as he mentioned, I'm a Fulbright Scholar and uh, also a founder of Critical Link. So, that's what I'm going to talk about today is kind of what my work here in Bangladesh is. So, I'll start with the question I get all the time here which is, what are you doing in Bangladesh? <laughs> and it's a question I'm sure my family uh, would love to know the answer to as well. But um, my story kind of starts in 2012. I came for the first time with one of my professors from medical school um, to train first responders, emergency first responders, uh, here in Bangladesh. And uh, the reason he gra graciously took me along was because before I was a medical student, I was a volunteer medic. Uh, so for many years, I was on my undergraduate volunteer ambulance, and uh, for many, many years I did that, and then I started training people in basic first aid and CPR and first responder skills that I'm going to tell you a little bit more about. And uh, so I had done some training in the U.S., and then I went to South Africa and worked there in places where ambulances wouldn't go, where people weren't getting help because the ambulances were afraid to go into the slums and, and places like that. And then I had this opportunity to come to Bangladesh. And I said, sure, that sounds really fun and exciting. We'll go for a month. And we trained thousands of first responders. We trained uh, police and security guards, but a lot, a lot of youth volunteers with um, some of the youth organizations here. And uh, we worked with medical students and doctors. And um, we taught very basic things, but things that can save lives in an emergency. And uh, I came back from this whole experience very much in love with Bangladesh and uh, very inspired, especially by the young people I met here, who said, Jen, we, we got trained. We're trained first responders. What do we do now? Am I just waiting for an accident to happen? Then I can use my, all this information that you taught us? And I thought, that's a very good point. You know, we, we train all these people, but now what are we doing with them? And so I thought, I'll apply for a Fulbright so I can come back and do some research and work on this project and see if we can find a way to connect these people to the people who need them, the people who are injured in the street. So I came back talking a lot about Bangladesh, and people back home were saying, where's Bangladesh exactly? What exactly is Bangladesh? And uh, it was a few months later, actually, when the whole world um, got to know Bangladesh. And uh, unfortunately, it was for something that was very tragic. You know, I think I was actually working in a hospital in Central Africa at the time, um, but I was, you know, in the middle of the jungle, I uh, had no, no electricity, no running water half the time I was there, but I was getting mobile alerts, you know, saying, Jen, did you, did you see what happened in, in Bangladesh? And everyone around the world was paying attention, and, and I think we were all very struck emotionally by, you know, seeing the injured people. But for me, it was something different. For me, I, I was like, yes, this is a project that needs to be done. This is a project that we need to, to, to go back to. I have to go back to Bangladesh for sure. Now I'm feeling more passionate than ever and wishing I was there. But what gave me a lot of good feelings is that while I wasn't there, my first responders were there. And they were sending Facebook messages and sending text messages and emails trying to organize themselves to go and help at Rana Plaza. And um, actually, it was the day after Rana Plaza that I got the email saying that I got my Fulbright grant. And I thought, yes, I think I have a mission, and this, this is where I'm supposed to be. Um, so that's how I got here, and then I came back and started working on this project. Now, before I kind of tell you about why first responders, or, you know, what I'm doing with my first responders, I kind of want to lay out the problem. Rana Plaza happens once in a lifetime. Let's hope never again anywhere else. But every day, all over the world, people are injured. And I think it's really shocking. Five million people a year die from accidents, road accidents and injuries. Five million. Okay, and that's more people than... This is, this is actually, uh, again, social media. I love it. Bill Gates uh, actually tweeted this out at his favorite graph of the year. Okay, and this is the causes of death worldwide. In green are injuries. And if you can see, there's a lot happening here. Yellow is infectious disease. But injuries kill more people than HIV, AIDS, TB, malaria, all of those things combined. And I think that that's a very shocking statement. When you say five million people, what are we doing about this? We spend 
$28 billion a year, and almost all of it goes to the yellow. Half of 1% goes to everything else. And for injuries and accidents, almost nothing. I couldn't even find how much money goes to it because it's almost nothing. And as a person working in health, in global health, how, how can we sit here and say, we're doing nothing for this? Because in everyone's mind, they think it's an accident. Accidents happen. And um, you know, what's really shocking to me is that accidents are on the rise. So this is the projections from the World Health Organization um, on the global burden of disease. Right now, road accidents alone are the ninth leading burden on global health as far as deaths and people who are affected. It's projected to be second or third in the next decade. That's shocking. So what are we doing about it? As a community, as a global health community, not very much. And the thing is, it's not equal deaths, okay? 92%, that's like 4.5 million people that die every year from accidents are dying in, in poorer countries. They're not dying in America and Britain, they're dying everywhere else. So this is a map of the world where it shows uh, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, they break everything down into high-income countries, middle-income countries, and low-income countries. So you can see South Asia is in the low- and middle-income part of the world. Um, basically, the only high-income countries on the map are most of North America, Europe, Saudi Arabia, Australia. Everything else falls into this low- and middle-income area. But then, even among low- and middle-income countries, South Asia has the highest rate of the rest of the world. So people are dying, and they're dying here. And this is really something, a reason why we should care. But for me, the thing that really gets me, and I've worked a lot with pediatric patients, they're my favorite patients, the kids, is that of the, those deaths from accidents in children, this is the really shocking one. Look at South Asia. In almost every age bracket, they have like half of the world's deaths here. Here. Why? Because most of the world does not have access to emergency medical services. That's 911. That's the ambulance coming in five or six minutes to get you. Okay? There's a lot of other reasons. Some of it's seat belts, some of it's helmets, some of it's prevention efforts. But a lot of it is just what happens here. If I, I've been in a few accidents now, unfortunately. I was like, please don't let me die in an accident while I'm doing accident research, please. Uh, the thing is, is there's no good pre-hospital care, or time is everything in emergency medicine. We say there's a golden hour where most of these people that die, they're actually people who can be saved if we get there fast enough. But all of us know, I mean, it took me two hours to get here and to Damundi from Gulshan today. Traffic, it's a big problem. So we have to think outside the box. We have to do things differently here than we would do them in the U.S. or in France. Um, and so that's what you know, I started thinking about. And um, what about Bangladesh? If you say, okay, you've given us all these numbers for South Asia. What are the numbers for Bangladesh? Um, these are some pictures I took at a hospital here. And I think if any of you go to any of the major trauma hospitals at Dhaka Medical, at the uh, Orthopedic and Trauma Hospital, NITOR, um, you, what you see is 100 patients a day, so many patients that there are not even enough space for them. Okay? And the data tells us that only about 15% of people make it alive to the hospital, okay? 85% of people die in the street. So if that 100 people is 15%, we're missing a lot of people that we never see in the hospital. And the problem is bigger than even it feels when you walk in there and see patients all over the floor. But I think this statistic is very shocking. So for every, like, one person who dies in the UK, 100 people die in Bangladesh from road accidents only. 20, 12 to 20,000 people here die on the road every year. And even compared to South Asia, for, you know, 160 people die for every 10,000 cars you see on the road, okay? 25 die in India. 16 die in Sri Lanka. Two die in America, and a one and a half die in the UK. And these are not acceptable numbers, right? If we want to vaccinate every child, or we want to get HIV treatment to every person in this whole world, why aren't we doing a better job taking care of people who've been in accidents, hurt people? Um, and the thing is, it's, it's hard to have a very complicated emergency medical system. It costs money, it takes years to develop, but what we know is that we train first responders in very, very basic things. How to stop bleeding, how to splint a fracture, you know, using a, 
a scarf. You know, you, how to move someone carefully so that you protect their head and their neck. Um, very, very simple, simple things save lives, and we've seen it in studies from other places, that they can save up to 25% or more of lives. That's a million and a half people, right? Just with first responders, people with, who are not doctors, people like all of you who, who do one day of training, okay? So I came back to Bangladesh last fall and started working with, again, these amazing young people that you have here in Bangladesh, and we came up with the idea for Critical Link. So what is Critical Link? Critical Link is an organization that trains first responders, but we need to do more than that. We have to connect them to where these things are happening. And we know in a place like this, location is important. I can't have a first responder in Gulshan coming to Danmundi if there's an accident. They'll never make it. They'll be in traffic for two hours and the person will die. But if I'm living in Gulshan 1 and you tell me there's an accident in Gulshan 1 circle, I can get there in five minutes. I can walk there in five minutes. I can rickshaw anywhere in Gulshan 1 in 10 minutes tops, right? So we knew we wanted a location-based system. And the other thing you have going for you here in Bangladesh, you have amazing mobile technology, actually. Very accessible, very cheap. Every rickshaw wallet has two phones ringing the whole time he's driving me. So you have the technology. We don't need very much. And then it's just to put it all together in a system that we're trying here in Bangladesh, because we know we have a problem here, but we also have the solution here. And we're hoping if this is a success, we can save lives here, but we can take this anywhere. That's the goal. So how does this system work? So this is a little um, kind of flow chart I made. Um, let's go through a scenario. A person is hit by a car. Right now, what happens? Everybody gathers around. Everyone stares. No one does very much. No one knows what to do. People here are good people. That's why I love Bangladesh. People here are generous, kind, people who want to help. And we saw that during Rana Plaza. People without skills wanted to go and help. Everybody wants to help. But if you don't know what to do, you can hurt people, actually. Uh, or people just are afraid to get involved if they don't know what to do. So now we've created a system where you can actually call. We have a call center running in Banani. We have an emergency number we're going to launch in the next month or so. Um, but it rings right now. You call a number like 911. It will ring in the center. So you can call the old-fashioned way, but we also developed a mobile app, which is really cool. And um, through the mobile app, you have first aid tips, um, a map that shows you where all the hospitals are. But it also has this really cool feature that allows you to report an accident from your phone. And the nice thing is it's kind of hands-off. Sometimes people are afraid to call. They don't want to get involved. You can send this uh, report, and it, you can say, hey, you know, rickshaw hit by a bus, Gulshan Circle. But it has a map, so it automatically will place your location on the map. You can move the pin if you need to, but it, sends, it has the location data. And you can also... Uh, include a picture if you want. That can be very helpful to the doctors, actually. When I'm working in the emergency room and someone shows me a picture of what the car looked like, I have a sense how bad they might be hurt, right? Or you get a lot of clues by seeing. Uh, also, the option to say, I'm injured, meaning that you, it sends along with all this data, blood type, emergency contact numbers, any health issues this person might have or medications or special needs. All of that will go to the call center as well. So this is our, our app is in beta testing right now. So that's an actual screen capture from the app. And the call center, person sitting at the call center, um, either gets the phone call or the, the alert pops up on the screen. And this is actually, again, another screenshot from our, our functional working system. And um, then they can send a notification to the first responders in that area. So they go, ah, it's in Gulshan. I'm going to send all of the first responders a message who are in Gulshan right now to say that there's an accident that has happened. Go help. Um, so here's the areas that we're covering just for the first phase of our, our project. We have about seven teams of first responders in seven areas of DACA. And we're hoping that it will continue to grow and maybe by the end of the year or next year we'll have all of DACA covered. And then we'll go to Chittagong and then hopefully we'll get all of Bangladesh. And we'll, I'm already getting requests to go other places. So maybe we'll go you know, to Sri Lanka or we'll go to Nepal or we'll go to Africa. Wherever we want to go, I think the system can go anywhere. So that's how it works. And then our first responders get a message, either an SMS, or if they're running a smartphone, they get a, a push notification through the app. Again, with the map details, with the relevant information, the photos. And there's a very social media component to it. I told you I'm...
kind of a social media junkie. So, you know, it has a four square kind of integration. So you can say, I'm going. And that way all the other first responders can see who's going. If we have nobody going, we have two people going, or 10 people going, I don't need to go. And then when you arrive, you check in. And what this does, it helps us keep stats, um, but it also, like, they can get bonus points. If they get there in less than 10 minutes, they get extra points, or they get a special badge, or whatever it is. So hopefully then they arrive on scene, give help, and get this person to a hospital quickly. That's the goal of the system. Um, so that's just a basic overview. And I'm just going to finish up by saying, you know, why is this important? Why do I care? And I think it's easy. I can sit here and give you a lot of numbers. Um, and I think the numbers are pretty overwhelming, if you ask me, um, that this is a problem everywhere in the world, but it's definitely a problem here in Bangladesh. And this has a lot of impacts. The economic impact alone is about 3% of the GDP. Motor vehicle accidents alone are about 3% of the GDP, which has, you have a pretty strong and pretty stable GDP here. And I think, like, I, it worked out something like $2.8 billion is lost in this country. Um, but then there's the development impact. Uh, when the wage earner, when a rickshaw wall is hurt, his whole family suffers if he's not driving a rickshaw, if he's dead. His wife, um, there's maternal health issues, there's child health issues, there's infant mortality. All of those things are wrapped into one, education. You need those wage earners. You need the young people. It's your future. Um, social impact is really, I think, intangible. Same with the personal impact. How do I quantify how it feels to lose a friend or a brother? or a mother in an accident. I can't. And it, I think we have to get away from this idea that there's nothing we can do. Accidents happen. Then why, why is it not happening equally? Because we don't give care, and we can give better care. And we can stop it being like, accidents are on the de decline in the US. 23% a year decline. Here, 83% increase every year, OK? So we have to do something, and I think we're trying, and this is what the system is about. And I just want to finish by saying that we say in the emergency room that the, it, it's the great equalizer of medicine. Sooner or later, everyone walks to the door. I don't care if you're homeless or you're a rickshaw puller or you're the minister, the prime minister, or a professor or a doctor. Anyone can be hurt. I, everyone is hurt. And everyone should have equal access to care. And if it were you or if it was someone that you loved, You'd want to know you can pick up the phone and get help. And, and the, a life that can be saved will be saved. So I just want to end it there and say, you know, just to wrap it back up with the, the dreams, that um, we heard a lot of stories. People had some not-so-happy stories from doctors uh, in their talks. But I hope that this gives you hope that there's something we can do. And I think Bangladesh can be a model for this. And it's my dream. I went into medicine because I love medicine, and I was five years old when I wanted to be a doctor. But I think uh, what's so gratifying about a project like this is that in medicine you help people one by one. You might save a life today, but when you do something big, when you try to affect more people and, and think outside the box and do something a little bit different, um, it might fail. It might have problems, but it will be challenges. But I think the impact you have can be more than the one life that you see. Um, like uh, one of our other speakers was talking earlier, it's the person that you tell and then they tell, it's the same thing. I don't know, I, when I train my first responders, um, I hope they save a life, but I hope they teach a skill to someone else that might save a life. And um, thank you all for your attention, and uh, if you're interested, keep, keep tabs on us. Critical Link is the name of the organization. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on uh, Foursquare, we are on every social media that exists, um, so find us, and thank you all for your attention.